Income Tax 2023-2024, American Opportunity Credit, What Expenses Qualify? Part number one. Get ready and some coffee, because if you try telling the IRS auditor a joke about taxes, they won't appreciate it. Most of this in first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts, a must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Information can be found in publication 970, Tax Benefits for Education Tax Year 2023, which you can find in the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live. Remember in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement ending not at net income, but taxable income. Taxable income, therefore, basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula. But as you can see, it's only half the story, half the battle. We have the second half of the income tax formula taking the taxable income, calculating the tax on it, not using a flat tax, mind you, but a progressive tax system, getting us to the tax before credits and other taxes, other taxes including things such as self-employment tax for sole proprietor Schedule C, for example, and then we have the credits, similar to deductions in that both credits and deductions are good, but if you had a dollar deduction, it would be up top in the income statement part, decreasing the taxable income, only providing a tax benefit based on the tax brackets that we are in. Whereas if we got a dollar credit, we might get that full dollar of benefit of the credit if up top in the non-refundable credits, we had the tax liability in order to consume it. Otherwise, if the credit took us below the tax liability, below zero, then the tax code would be acting as a welfare or benefit program rather than a tax system. That gets us to the total tax. Then we have payments and refundable credits, another credit category down here. We know what the payments are. Those are the W-2 withholdings. Those are the estimated tax payments that we make. The refundable credits are those credits that may take us below the tax liability being zero, resulting in the tax code being used not as tax collection tool, but rather as a welfare benefit safety net type program, finally getting us to the tax refund or the tax due. We're looking at the education credit and typically the IRS will require the educational institutions to provide a form to people who are paying, for example, uh, the tuitions, the tax IRS having the ability to do that because typically the IRS has influence over the tax system or over the, the educational institutions. Why? Because the educational institutions might be getting funding from the government directly and or because the students that are enrolled might be uh, getting loans that could be basically government type loans, which is a big deal to the institutions. And three, because the students themselves want to get benefits uh, in terms of education uh, deduction of the, of the costs that they are paying. 
And therefore, the institutions to comply with that will have to comply with the information to provide that to the students, right? So you would expect to get a 1098T of some kind if enrolled in higher education, such as a college. Then the question is, what kind of tax benefits are related to that? Usually there's a hierarchy of benefits. First, we go for the credits, the bigger one, the American Opportunity Credit, then the Lifetime Learning Credit, and then to take it as a deduction if we still can, can't get those other two credits and possibly there's a ability to take it as a deduction somewhere. That's our general hierarchy or thought process. So this is uh, the part two looking at the refundable portion of the American Opportunity Credit on uh, part two. And this is going to be page two of the form 1040 where the, tra the credits are at. We have the non-refundable portion of the credits up top and then the refundable portions down here in the payments category. All right. So what expenses qualify? We are talking once again about the American Opportunity Credit at this time, the credit that has the more strict uh, requirements. And then we're going to talk later more specifically about the lifetime learning credit. We usually think about these in order, seeing if we qualify for the American Opportunity Credit. If not, then go into the lifetime learning. All right. So the American Opportunity Credit is based on adjusted qualified education expenses you pay for yourself, your spouse, or a dependent you claim on your tax return. So then we have the question, of course, of what are the qualifying expenses for education expenses you would think well that's easy it's going to be reported on the the 1098t but not so easy because the 1098t really is going to be taken into consideration oftentimes what was paid for like tuition now that tuition sometimes might take into consider other consideration other things meaning the institution might be providing the books and the materials and so on, which might be included in the cost of the tuition, or they might not. They might just be including the class time, the actual location where you go, and then they even exclude that. Then they just kick you off campus and then you get on a Zoom call, <laughs> take your classes on Zoom. And then, but, and then they make you buy your own books and whatnot. So then, so then, then the question is, well, what about the supplies and books that they made me buy after I had to pay for just the classroom and the teacher, and then they kicked me out of the classroom and the teacher onto a zoo, onto some kind of Zoom call. So that's the credit. So generally, the credit is allowed for adjusted qualified education expenses paid in 2023 for an academic period beginning in 2023 or beginning in the first three months of 2024. We've seen this concept a few times at this point in time, remembering that we're on a cash-based system for the most part, but we typically prepay for education because again the government wants their money first before they tell you they're kicking you out of the classroom into a zoom call because some some somebody got sick or something over in the other side of the world and they had to do so that that's what they had to do that any case so that means that if you're taking the first part of 2024 paid it in 2023 then you might still be able to, to claim the thing in 2023, right? So for example, if you paid 1,500 in December, 2023 for the qualified tuition for the spring 2024 semester beginning January, 2024, you can use the 1,500 in figuring your 2023 credit. All right, academic period, what does that mean? An academic period includes semester, trimester, quarter or other period of study such as a summer school session as reasonably determined by the educational institution so again these used to be much more standardized now institutions are are having different kind of terms for how they're going to be structuring their courses which in theory i think is actually a good thing because what you want to be able to do is allow the institutions in a free market to test out different structures to determine which structures are best given the current environment, environments changing over time, given the fact that we have things like other resources, online tools and whatnot, and all this kind of stuff. So when they overstructure the regulations, it ties people, it, it's kind of like trying to fight global warming by saying that you have to use a specific type of filter in a factory. And then time passes and you, and you realize, hey, the filter is not the most efficient tool that we could have used. We've learned to do better things to better 
make things better and actually economically feasible. And you can't do it because they put this stupid rule in that you have to use this stupid filter that was useful 10 years ago. Same thing kind of happens here, right? So you would think we would like to test out different kind of structures in the current environment and let the market determine which is the most efficient, right? So if an educational institution uses credit hours or clock hours and doesn't have academic terms, each payment period can be treated as an academic period. All right. So basically, you have to depend on the educational institution to some degree to help you out with that. And if you're in a non-traditional kind of situation where they're doing, and again, be careful. I'm not trying to say that one institution is better than the other. I'm just saying they all seem a little out of whack right now to me. I don't think there's any guaranteed institutions, so you got to do your research on it. But the institution for sure should be able to answer these kind of questions. And if they can't, that's certainly kind of a red flag. So paid with borrowed funds. So you can claim an American Opportunity Credit for qualified education expenses paid with the proceeds of a loan. So in other words, you might say, and people often, you can compare this to purchasing a home where people often say, well, I, I have a home, but I don't really own it. The bank owns my home. Why do they say that? because they bought the home and they might've put like a 20% down payment and then 80% they took out a loan to pay for the home. So they say the bank owns the home. Is that really true? No, it started out that that was like a joke, right? Because they're saying, hey, look, I'm not doing as great as I, the bank owns the home, but it's kind of a joke because, it's, because the bank doesn't own the home. If the bank owned the home, the bank would be coming to the kitchen table to have discussions about what color you're going to paint the home, you know, and who's going to live where within the home and so on and so forth. The bank doesn't do that. They have no ability to make the day to day choices about how you're going to use the home because they don't own it. They just gave you a loan in order for you to purchase the home. What they have is recourse in the event that you don't pay the loan back to then confiscate the home to get because it's on it's on as collateral. So the so there's a big difference between it's collateral on the home and the bank owns the home. Similarly with education, most people go to school, they get loans in order to go the, to to go to school. So the you're you're still paying for the school even though you borrowed the money because the purchasing power of the money that you borrowed is still something that you paid for because you're contractually obligated to pay interest on the loans, which you're going to do in the future, which hopefully you'll be able to do with the proceeds from the education that you're going to use in order to get work to pay back the loan. Most people I, I would imagine are basically hoping that they'll just have the loans forgiven. I don't think that's a good game plan to have. I can understand that incentive, but, but I wouldn't depend on that personally, although, you know, problem could happen anyway. So that's the idea. So even if you got a loan, you could you you really paid for it and therefore it qualifies as an expense. So use the expenses to figure the American Opportunity Credit for the year in which the expenses are paid, not the year in which the loan is repaid. So so obviously it's not the year that you pay back the loan that you get to deduct the amount as expenses for education. No, it's when you paid the money using the loan proceeds to get the education. Okay, so when you do repay the loan, by the way, you will be paying interest. So then you're not going to get a tax benefit from paying back the loan, pro the principal, but possibly the interest on the loan you get a benefit from as a, a, another type of d a deduction for the financing of the loan. And you'll get a different kind of form from the institution to help with that. So that's usually fairly straightforward. We've talked about in that in prior courses or sections. So treat loan payments sent directly to the educational institution as paid on the date the institution credits the student's account. All right. So can you claim the American Opportunity Credit? Let's look at the flow chart. So, so did you pay qualified education expenses in 2023 for an eligible student? So you paid for the expenses for an eligible student. If yes, we go on. If no, you can't claim the American Opportunity Credit. So next one. Did, did the academic period for which you paid qualified education expenses begin in two, three, 2023 or the first three months, the first part of 2024, because you prepaid it because that's the normal process. If yes, we can continue. If no, you can't do it. Okay, yes. 
the is the eligible student you your spouse if married filing jointly or your dependent you claim on your tax return so it has to be someone on the return typically if yes we continue if no then you can't claim so are you uh listed as a dependent on another person's tax return so if you yourself are listed on someone else's tax return, you would think that you're not the one that can get the benefit of the credit, but the person that's claiming you as a dependent possibly would. So we're going to say no to continue. Uh, is your filing status married filing separately? So if you are married, you could choose to file married filing separate, but you might lose some benefits such as the ability to take this credit, for example. So if we go no, we continue. So for any part of 2023, were you or your spouse a non-resident alien who didn't elect to be treated as a resident alien for tax purposes? So we're going to say no on that one to continue. Is your modified adjusted gross income, your MAGI, less than 90000 or 180000 if married filing separately? So if you have over those income thresholds, the IRS is saying you're on your own paying for your own education sorry that we subsidized the thing and it's so dang expensive now due to our subsidies but that's the way it is you do it you deal with your own thing rich person if <laughs> sorry i didn't mean to sound so like mean right there but any case yes if yes we're going to continue uh gross in, uh did you use the same expenses to claim a deduction or credit so meaning if you already used the expenses to claim a deduction somewhere else, you can't claim this one too, because then you'd be double dipping. Although typically you would try to claim this one first because you get the biggest benefit from this one. But the point is you can't double dip claiming the same expenses elsewhere. So we're going to say no. Were the same expenses paid entirely with tax-free scholarship, grant, or employer-provided uh, educational assistance? So if you got a scholarship, the scholarship i'm going for a scholarship if you got a scholarship then uh is you already got a tax benefit because you don't have to report that as income meaning that would be similar to like you had income and then you got a deduction for it you, so you can't take the tax benefit you already got from money that you don't have to include as income to pay for the school and then say that it's an expense and then get another credit for it because again that kind of be like a form of double dipping so we're going to say no did you or someone else receive a refund of all the expenses? So again, you can't like pay for the expenses and then you get a refund for the expenses and then you still take a deduction for the expenses that you pay that you didn't really pay because they gave the money back to you, right? So if no, then you can claim the American Opportunity Credit then and only then at the flowchart. Okay, continuing on. Student withdraws from classes. So this happens all the time students enroll in the class and then they're like this is and then they're like dude you just kicked me out of the classroom because some weirdo like called me a name or something and it started marching around and now i have to take on zoom i'm out of here i'm out of here okay and then, <laughs> and then so you <laughs> You can claim the American Opportunity Credit for qualified education expenses not refunded when a student withdraws. So if you withdraw because of that situation or so, or any situation, you, and they don't let you re, they don't let you refund the money because they probably you know unless because they they have a time limit typically that's pretty short, and so then so like right after the cutoff date when they're like you pay you pay in advance you go to school they let you into the classroom for like a few days until the cutoff date is where you can't pay the money back and then and then they find some excuse to kick you off into a zoom call and they're like yeah it's not refundable at this point you might as well just hang out in the zoom conference <laughs> so, just kidding just kidding anyway qualified education expenses for purposes of the american opportunity credit qualified education expenses are tuition and certain related expenses required for enrollment or attendance as an eligible educational institution. So obviously then we have to kind of think about what the eligible educational institutions are. Eligible educational institution, what does that even mean, man? What does that even mean? I'll tell you. An eligible education institution is any college, university, vocational school, or other post-secondary educational institution eligible to participate in a student aid program administered by the U.S. Department of Education. So here's the key, right? Because 
you, you might think that the university clearly is getting funding by the government and therefore the government can tell the university what to do, such as, you know, issue this 1098 and so on and so forth, give us this information. But institution eligible to participate in student program uh, administering by the U.S. Department of Education. So you could have like student aid program loans, right? So those loans are going to be important for most people to go to school, given the fact that schools have been subsidized so long that the tuition is quite high and therefore unreachable for most people unless they get loans. And the loans, then, even if you're like a vocational school, the school is going to be dependent to some degree on the loans, right? So that means that they're, they have to comply because, again, the IRS has the foothold in there, right? And they have the leverage to say they're going to comply. So in any case, that would mean that when you go to an educational institution, you're probably taking a loan. And if you're taking a loan, whatever institution you're going to, which is a higher educational institution, is probably going to be an eligible educational institution because they're trying to get those that money from the loan dollars, <laughs> which is where the students are getting the money. So, uh, but in any case, the institution should be able to tell you that. And if they can't tell you that, that's not a good sign for the institution typically. So virtually all uh, accredited public, nonprofit, and proprietary privately owned profit-making post-second institutions meet this definition. So again, you might think, well, look, I'm going to a, a, a nonprofit or proprietary school. And you, me as a more capitalistic minded, free market competition minded person tend to think that it would be nice if we had more profit seeking schools rather than these schools that are just being subsidized by the government because then they can have more models that are geared towards th things that are that are current in the, the market. But again, even with those schools, they can't they're typically going to be subject to the money from the government that's not coming directly to them but through the student loans so that still kind of hamstrings them and makes you kind of somewhat suspicious about exactly how things are structured because again they're they're still kind of tied to the government uh and that in that way uh and so in any case pros and cons to that so an eligible educational institution also includes certain educational institutions located outside the United States that are eligible to participate in student aid program administered by the U.S. Department of Education. So related expenses, what are those? Student actively, uh, activity fees are included in qualified education expenses only if the fees must be paid to the institution as a condition of enrollment or attendance. However, expenses for books, supplies, and equipment needed for the course of study are included in qualified education expenses, whether or not the materials are purchased from the educational institution. So this is a common scenario, right? So like if you go to some institutions, usually like the vocational institutions, like if you're going to be a nurse or something like that, and, and then the school oftentimes will include all of the stuff that you need because you might need a bunch of stuff uh, to do that within like the fees of the institution and uh and therefore you would think it might be reported on the 1098t because you're paying it directly to the institution which is paying for all the books and supplies and whatnot but if you go to a lot of traditional schools uh and uh, the typical undergraduate system might be that you're just going to a, a of giant forum with a hundred people in it or whatnot, and you have to buy your own book uh, to do that. Well, then, then the question is, what do I have to buy the book from the college live bookstore, or can I go to another bookstore or something like that? And typically, if the they're saying here, if the book supplies and equipment needed for the course of study are includified in the educational expenses, whether or not the materials are purchased from the educational institution, which means that the amount reported on the 1098 T might not include those things, which is why the form 1098T is usually necessary to report the credit because the IRS has at least an indication that you are taking qualified uh, education 
credits, right? But it might not e exactly match the amount that you claim, and that's okay. Remember that that's different than like a W-2 situation. If you get a W-2, you have to report the amount on the W-2, or the IRS will almost certainly send you a letter because they have the W-2. But uh, so if you want to fix it, if it's wrong, you have to go to the institution or you should start by going to the institution that issued the W-2. But here you have to get the, the form in order to the IRS to see that you actually took some education from an, a qualified educational institution. But it's quite possible that the amount on the form doesn't exactly match and is often less than the amount that you might actually report for educational expenses because that might not include things like books, supplies, equipment, and so on and so forth. All right, prepaid expenses. Qualified education expenses paid in 2023 for academic period that begins in the first 30 months of 2024 can be used in figuring an education credit for 2023 only. So see academic period. So we have that cutoff situation. Once again, for example, if you pay $2,000 in December, 2023 for qualified tuition for 2024 winter quarter that begins in January, 2024, you can use the $2,000 in figuring an education credit for 2023 only if you meet all the other requirements. Caution. You can't use any amount that you paid in 2022 or 2024 to figure the qualified education expenses you used to figure your 2023 education expenses. So, so clearly you can't really double dip, obviously. There's a cut, the cutoff's a little bit confusing because we're kind of on a cash-based method, you know, for the most part. But clearly, if you paid for things in 2023, for example, and you got the benefit of paying for them in 2023, even though the classes didn't start until 2024, you can't also include them as expenses towards the credit in 2024, because once again, you'd be double dipping. Example, uh, Je Jefferson is a sophomore in University V's degree program in dentistry. This year, in addition to tuition, there is a requirement to pay a fee to the university for the rental of a dental. Did they mean to rhyme all this stuff? Because that's pretty, in the Iris doesn't usually like do poetry here. But in any case, the university for the rental of the dental equipment uh, used in this program. So because the equipment rental is needed for the course of study, Jefferson's equipment rental fee is a qualified expense. Example number two, Grace and William, both first year students at College W. Oh, it's a frightening time, that first year freshman time of college. So they're required, it's exciting too though, it's an exciting time, but in any case, they're required to have certain books and other reading materials to use their mandatory first year classes. So the college has no policy about how students should obtain these materials. So some financial, some college institutions may include that in the bundle. They just give you the materials. You don't have any question about it, but a lot of institutions will say, here's what you need to get, get it however you want to get it, but you need this book, okay? So, so, but any student who purchases them from the College W's bookstore will receive a bill directly from the college. So William bought the books from a friend. Grace bought the books at College W's bookstore. Both are qualified education expenses. So many times around colleges, there's gonna be bookstores where they buy and sell books because clearly the secondary market for books to return your book after the course is a big thing oftentimes. So you might be able to shop around and get your books somewhere other than the bookstore of the college, which you know might be more expensive oftentimes, and you might still be able to deduct that in this case. So example number three. So when Kelly enrolled at College X for the freshman year, the school required payment of a separate student activity fee in addition to the tuition. This activity is required, that's the key, of all students and is used solely to fund on-campus organizations and activities run by students such as the student newspaper and the student government. No portion of the fee covers personal expenses. So although labeled as student activity the fee, the fee is required by Kelly's enrollment and attendance at College X and is a qualified expense. So the key of course being it's, qual it's required. So, okay, 
So no double benefit allowed. So no double dip in here. That's what I call it. So you can't do any of the following. These are no dues, can't do. Deduct higher education expenses on your income tax return as for example, business expenses and also claim an American Opportunity Credit based on those same expenses. So typically again, the hierarchy usually being, I'm gonna to try to get the credit because usually the credit's gonna be more beneficial than anything else. American Opportunity Credit first, then the Lifetime Learning Credit. And then if you can't get those, you might take it as a deduction if you can deduct it somewhere such as possibly a business expense. That's usually the hierarchy that usually comes to the biggest benefit uh, but you can't do both because that's what I would be calling double dipping. You dip two two times after you ate you, you ate the French fry and then you then you put it back in the ketchup again and you can't do that because it's gross with ketchup, right? Because if, well, at least if you're sharing with other people. If you're doing if you were eating yourself, then you can then you can double dip the French fries. Maybe I don't know any case that's just through I was trying to find a comparison so claim an American opportunity credit for any student uh, and use any of the students expenses in figuring your lifetime learning credit so once again you can't be doing both the lifetime learning and the American opportunity with the same expenses if you had two different students on the same tax return even one qualifying for the American opportunity, the other for the lifetime learning, or both qualifying for the American opportunity, possibly then, but you can't take the same expenses and have two credits for the same expenses. So figure the tax-free portion of the distribution from a Coverdell Education Savings Account, that's an ESA, or Qualified uh, Tuition Program, a QTP, using the same expenses you use to figure the American Opportunity Credit. So these are going to be ways that we can basically save in a tax beneficial format, which again gives us a tax benefit. So we have to then come into these problems of a double dipping situation there. You could see the coordination with the American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning Credits in Chapter 6 and coordination with the American Opportunity and Lifetime Credits in Chapter 7 of the publication if you're in that situation and you want to dive into that in more detail. Claim a credit based on a qualified education expenses paid with tax-free educational assistance, such as scholarship, grant, or assistance provided by an employer. So now you paid for college, but you paid for it with tax, with, with, uh, with free money, basically. Claim a credit based on qualified education paid with tax-free educational assistance, such as a scholarship. So you didn't have to include the scholarship, for example, in income. And so it's kind of like you already got a deduction for it, right? Because it would be similar to you got money. Usually the IRS says anything that you get is income unless we say otherwise. They're basically saying otherwise, meaning you don't have to include it in income, which is kind of equivalent to saying you included an in income and then deduct it as an above the line deduction, right? An adjustment to income. So, so you already got a benefit. So if you, if you, you can't then get another benefit from it because you would be putting the French fry in the ketchup after all, after you already bit it and other people are using the ketchup and it's gross then that makes it gross. So adjustments to qualified education expenses. So for each student, reduce the qualified education expenses paid by or on behalf of that student under the following rules. So the result is the amount of uh, adjusted qualified education expenses for each student. So you got the tax-free educational institute uh, assistance. So for tax-free educational assistance received in 2023, reduce the qualified education expenses for each academic period by the amount of tax-free educational assistance allocated to that academic period. So now you have this problem, of course, you're saying, okay, now I got this tax-free educational assistance, possibly a scholarship. So I know that I already got a benefit from the scholarship that I used to pay for the college, but the, the 1098T then might not include the fact that I have that theirs, right? So, so then the question is, well, how do I calculate the amount of expenses that I paid. Well, you'd have to take the amount of expenses that you paid minus, you would think, the tax-free educational assistance 
and the difference then being what you paid with non-tax-free educational assistance, which can then be used to calculate the credit. So some tax-free educational assistance received after 2023 may be treated as a refund for qualified educational expenses paid in 2023. This tax-free educational assistance is any tax-free educational assistance received by you or anyone else after 2023 for the qualified education expenses paid on behalf of a student in 2023 or attributable to, to uh, enrollment uh, at an eligible educational institution during 2023. So if this tax-free educational assistance is received after 2023, but before you file your 2023 income tax return, see refunds received after 2023, but before your income tax return is filed later. If the tax-free educational assistance is received after 2023 and after you file your 2023 uh, income tax return, see re refunds received after 2023 and after uh, your income tax return is filed. So we have these kind of cutoff situations with regards to the refunds. And you can kind of compare this situation to what you might be more familiar with with income tax preparation, that being like the state income tax refunds. So, for example, if you're in a state that has income taxes like uh, California and you were itemizing, you took itemized deductions on the federal income taxes, you might be able to deduct part of the state taxes. So the problem with that, of course, is that usually, like with the federal income taxes, you, you're going to overpay the state income taxes to avoid getting hit by the sticks of penalties and interest. So they're going to give you a refund in the following year, which means that you overpaid your taxes and you might have got a deduction from it in the prior year. So, so I might have got a deduction for state taxes in 2022, and then they gave me a refund in 2023. What do I do? Do I have to amend 2022 because I over deducted based on the fact that I paid more taxes and then they refunded it to me? The general idea is no, we're not going to try to go back and amend the prior year because that's a pain, but rather fix it in the current year. So if we got a benefit last year, we'll try to fix it in the current year by having to include it in, in income this year. You have similar kind of situations here where basically uh, if you had like a refund uh, situation of a benefit that you that you took in the prior year. Similar kind of questions in terms of the cutoffs come up, which we might dive into in future presentations, but that's the the general gist of it or the idea of it. Do I have to go if if if, for example, they gave me a refund before I filed the tax return the, or in the same year, you would think I can then adjust my calculations in that current year before I file the tax return. If, however, I already filed the tax return, I claimed the expenses, then they gave me a refund in the next year up that's for the, the expenses I paid in the prior year, then the question comes up, do I need to amend the prior year or do I need to, uh, can I take care of it in some way in the current year? So that's, those are the, that's the kind of concept. All right. So tax-free educational assistance includes, so the tax-free parts of scholarship and fellowship grants, see tax-free scholarship and fellowship grants in chapter one. You got the tax-free part of Pell Grants, see Pell Grants and other Title IV uh, uh, need-based education grants in chapter one. You got the uh, employer-provided educational assistance, chapter 10 of this publication. So you got the Veterans Educational Assistance, see Veterans Benefits, Chapter 1, and any other non-taxable tax-free payments other than gifts or inheritances received as, as uh, educational assistance. So generally, any scholarship or fellowship grant is treated as tax-free. However, a scholarship or fellowship grant isn't treated as tax-free to the extent the student includes it in gross income. So that's the idea. You get the grant. If you don't include it in income, that you got money that you don't have to pay taxes on. That's the general idea. If you do include it in income, now it's income. And you would think that if it's income, then you'd be able to use the expenses that you paid with that income to calculate towards a credit or deduction, 
depending on the circumstances. So the student may uh, the student may or may not be required to file a tax return for the year the scholarship or fellowship grant is received, and either of the following is true. So the scholarship or fellowship grant or any part of it must be applied uh, by its terms to expenses such as room and board other than qualified education expenses as defined in qualified education expenses in chapter one. The scholarship or fellowship grant or any part of it may be applied by its terms to expenses such as room and board other, other than qualified education expenses as defined in qualified education expenses in chapter one. So when we think about these qualified education expenses, note that the scholarship might not line up exactly to the qualified education expenses, which we think of as typically being the cost of the tuition, of course, and then possibly the supplies. When you get into room, board, like food and whatnot, then you could have basically differences uh, in, in those items, right? So caution. So a student can't choose to include income uh, in income a scholarship or fellowship grant provided by an Indian tribal government that is excluded from income under the Tribal General Welfare Exclusion Act of 2014 or benefits provided by an educational program described in Revenue Procedure uh, 2014-35, Section 5.02-2B. So now we're seeing some overlap between these these types of beneficial kind of programs which can get quite complex because they start to run into each other causing confusion between them tip you may be able to increase the combined value of an education credit if the student includes some or all of the scholarship or fellowship grant in income in the year it is received so for example see uh, coordination with pell grants and other scholarships later so we saw kind of a similar situation with this uh, when we saw like combat pay when calculating things like the earned income tax credit, meaning that usually uh, if you have some kind of income, some kind of payment that was paid to you that you don't have to include in income, that's of course normally a benefit for an income tax system because the higher your income, the more the tax you typically pay. But in some situations, it could be that that it, more income would be good and that is often the case when you have these like refundable credits or that's when the case could happen so we saw it before with like the earned income credit for example earned income credit actually goes up as your earned income goes up and therefore in some cases you would want to so so the government isn't helping you then by excluding combat pay if including the combat pay would result in a higher earned income credit sometimes. And you have a similar kind of situation here with the education credits because some of the education credits might be a refundable component to them. So in that case, then you're saying, okay, well, now I got this money that I don't have to include an in income, but my income is totally low anyways, because I don't, I'm not earning any income. And I'm re if I'm reporting it on my own tax return, not on someone else's, not on my parents, then then it could you could imagine a situation where you'd be better off if you were to include the income as earned income, so that you can get advantage of the refundable part of the of the credit. So so you can imagine a situation where that could be possible. But oftentimes, you would think that that if they don't have much income they might be a dependent on someone else's tax return who does have income, right? And so in any case, that's the idea.